Amen. I invite you to take the Word of God with me, please, and find in the New Testament the book of Jude, towards the end, the very end, right before uh, the final book of, of Revelation. Uh, we find here the book of Jude, and we'll read here, verse together, uh, Jude chapter 1, and uh, we'll read verse 3 together, praying that God would use this uh, in our hearts to stir us up in a special way. I would ask you to stand one more time, please, as we'll uh, take God's Word and read that portion, uh, and then we'll ask that the Lord would take it and apply it to our lives. I preached through the book of Jude, I believe it was last year, and sometimes the, the timing of that <laughs> is, uh, is a little blurry in my mind, but I know last year we, we talked through it and uh, tried to bring some, some key things out. But the Lord uh, is returning us to this, uh, specifically a, a one thought uh, that I believe could, could be very useful in our lives. Here in the book of Jude, the Bible says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. That are the believers. We're talking about those who are sanctified positionally by God the Father, sanctified in Him through salvation, preserved and then called. And so all of us, if we're believers, we know Christ is our Savior. Uh, then we fall in this category. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, then you would not fall in this category. But if we know the Lord, then we are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Verse number 2, it says, Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Now verse 3 is a verse I want to draw your attention to today. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For our message today, please notice with me the theme in the middle of verse 3. Earnestly contend for the faith. Earnestly contend for the faith. And let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we come to you now knowing that we cannot do these things that need to be done without the, the aid and the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray you forgive us where we failed you. I pray that you would cleanse us. I pray that you would prepare us now to be able to take in uh, the truths and the things that you have for us this day. I pray that you would take distractions from our hearts and minds, the things that perhaps weighed us down as we walked through the door. May we leave those things at your feet, and may we now give our whole heart to this. Uh, speak to us today. May you speak to every heart today in a special way. Lord, if there's a spiritual need, whether it's that of salvation through Christ, or whether it's a spiritual need of some other kind in the Christian's life, may you help that to be met today. May we leave this place differently than we came in. And we do love you, most of all, for your love for us, for giving your life for us, providing salvation through your death on the cross. Thank you for Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us. And now we just ask that you would be with us, Lord, that your presence would pervade this entire auditorium and this building uh, as we listen to the Word of God and what you have for us today. Open our hearts and, opens our, and open our minds, and we will praise thee for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In this particular book of the Bible, which is one of the shortest books of the Bible, if you will, it's a dynamite book. Uh, it's small but it's powerful. It is a small book, but not small in its meaning or its import, or it, it is not small in its effect. But the book of Jude is a, a great book. That's a book that we can learn many things from. But I would like to just focus simply on this one truth today, that we must earnestly contend for the faith. And we'll learn from this book how we are to do that. But we must earnestly contend for the faith. 
I want you to understand this, this truth today, that the faith was once delivered to Christ, or excuse me, by Christ and His apostles. The faith was once delivered, as the Word of God says, it was once delivered by Christ and His apostles, but must be contended for in every generation. You may want to write that down. The faith was once delivered by Christ and the apostles, but it must be contended for in every generation since then. The Lord Jesus delivered it to us. The reason we have the faith is because Christ is the object of our faith. He is the author of our faith. He is the finisher of our faith. And our Lord Jesus delivered the faith to us. He delivered it through His apostles. If you ever read the high priestly prayer of Christ in John chapter number 17, you'll find that He prayed for those who would believe on Me through their word. And that is all of us as we have come to faith in Christ only because the Lord passed on the faith to His uh, immediate apostles. And through that now, we have the faith of Christ that is, as that has been disseminated to us through His Word, given to us, passed down, and I thank God that it has been passed down. But the point today that we must understand is that the faith was delivered only one time, but it must be contended for in every generation. When we think of this idea of contending, this is not a half-hearted thing. This is not something that we can just take or leave. This is not something that is of minor importance. But this is something that we must understand that is imperative. It's essential. It's absolutely necessary that we will earnestly contend for the faith because if we don't contend for the faith, I have news for you this morning, nobody will. If we don't contend for the faith, no one else will. Many people might say, I'm a Christian or I believe in Christ. There is a whole gamut of people and types of people who will say, I'm a Christian. They'll say, I believe. Uh, I believe in Jesus or I believe in what He did or something like that. And they'll say that they're a Christian. But the number of people that will contend for that is a much smaller number. We must contend for the faith. When we think of contend, we, we then think of the word contention. Now, I'm not speaking about arguing. I'm not talking about we go into people's face and start telling them that they're, they're wrong and we're right. No. But contending for the faith is something that we do with vigor. It's something we do with zeal. It's something that we realize that this is not something we just take or leave, but the faith of Jesus Christ is not to be uh, to be promulgated around in, in some kind of a mean spirit, but it is to be given passionately and zealously because this is the faith that was once delivered and must be contended for in every generation. It must be contended for in every generation. If there's something that you hold dear, something that you believe with all of your heart, is something you're willing to contend for it. You're willing to give yourself to that. You're willing to have a conversation about it. You're willing to fight for it. Are you willing to fight for your family? I hope you're willing to fight for your family. I'm sure you are and you love your family. You're willing to fight for them. You're willing to contend for them. You're willing to stand up for them. And we must be willing to stand up for and to contend for and be willing to stand by the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, He rose again, and because He rose again, it validated everything He ever said or did, and then He passed that on, He gave the faith for us, and the Lord Jesus is not walking on this earth in a visible, tangible way right now, as you and I know, as He once did. He is not. But instead, the Lord Jesus chose that you and I would be His ambassadors, that you and I would be the ones who would stand and would speak in His stead. And if you ever get a hold of that truth, it will change your life. That the Lord has chosen you and me. And what a grave thing it is. And what a sobering thing it is for me. I don't know what it is for you. But for me to think that God has chosen me to be a messenger 
for Him. Someone who is obliged to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered. He delivered it once, but it must be contended for in every generation. Notice that our, the apostle here, the writer rather, says, I exhort you. I exhort you. He's, he's saying, this is something that I'm not just suggesting. Okay, This is not a suggestion, but I am exhorting you. I am compelling you. I am beyond encouraging you. I am exhorting you to earnestly contend for the faith because, dear friends, we live in a time today. We live in a time today that there will be many opposing things, many opposing people who will not agree with the faith or, or want the faith or desire the faith, much less believe in the faith. It is upon us and it is our duty and it is our responsibility to earnestly contend for the faith. He says, I exhort you. And the word earnestly, earnestly contend has the idea uh, zealously and eagerly and with real desire. I have a question for you today. Where is the zeal? Where is the real desire to contend for the faith? Where is the eagerness that we must have in order that the faith will be contended for? If we have a family member that we're protecting and keeping safe in our house, if anything ever came along to breach that protection, we'd be on our feet. We would be right there. We would be contending. We would be protecting. We would be delivering. We would be right in that situation, ready to fend off the opposition. Now, you and I as Christians, we're not really fending off the opposition except for the devil himself. We're not fending off the opposition of the world. We're not fending off in a physical way like you could uh, 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 perhaps keep a robber or something from coming in. But the idea is that we would rise up to that challenge. And we must realize that the faith is under attack. The faith of Christ is under attack. People are trying to assault it and assail it. And nobody will contend for that faith except you and me. No one will do it. There may be other Christians that will do it. There may be many Christians. But would you like to be part of that group of Christians that will contend for it? The faith is under attack. And I am not here to tell you just about the attack but about the response. How that we must contend for it. We don't just sit by. If someone breached your house, you wouldn't just sit by. What does Christ say? He said if the good men of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, surely he would not have suffered his house to be broken up. And let me tell you that we know that the thief and the destroyer is already here. The devil does not come but for to kill and to steal and to destroy. And He's come to steal men's lives and men's souls. He's come to destroy the truth of God's Word and what God has already established. He has come to steal away the joy and the peace and the happiness of every person in this world if He had His way. He's come to destroy people. But we, as God's people, are here to contend for the faith so that people don't have to be stolen by the devil. People don't have to be destroyed. People don't have to uh, be taken in his grasp and in his clutches. But instead, we must earnestly contend for the faith. We must see the importance of such a task. Why must we do this? We will not read the, the book or we will not even read much more of this particular portion of it, but I just want you to see in verse number 4, why is it that we are to earnestly contend for the faith? Why is it? Because verse 4, the word for, F-O-R, is a conjunction, basically meaning because. It says, for there are certain men crept in 
unawares. We think about the thief in the night. He creeps in. He doesn't say, hey everybody, I'm here, I'm ready to steal everything. He doesn't say, all right, where's the key? Let me get in. But he creeps in unawares. He creeps in at a time when those are at rest and those within the house are not prepared for it. And he says, there are certain men crept in. Now, crept is past tense, which means it's already happened. That he has already crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation because the Lord knew that they would go this way. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying our only Lord God, the only Lord God, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Why are we to contend for the faith? Because of the simple fact that there are certain men that have crept in unawares. There are men who are preaching a false gospel. By the way, there's only one gospel. There's only one gospel. The gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and bodily, physical resurrection. That is the only gospel any other gospel, the Bible says it's not a gospel, but it would pervert the gospel. In other words, it is a perversion. It is a distortion of the truth and of the truth of the gospel. And there's men who would preach these things and would add the prosperity aspect and say, well, we add to His death, burial, and resurrection that if you know the, the Lord, then you promise to have success. And nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus said, you take up your cross and follow me. But there are many who are creeping in unawares, even within our own churches, that would teach that which is wrong. That's why it's so important. We must know what we believe. We must have a, a pastor that we trust. We must have those that we can trust as leaders. And we must be in our the Word of God reading and studying and knowing the truth because there are many who will come who will, who will shine doubt, who will cast doubt on the things of God. And by the way, you can find them easily. There's a whole internet out there full of it. Full of people who will cast doubt on everything you've ever believed in one sentence. Everything you've ever believed in one sentence. And my dear friends, we must understand that according to the truth of God's Word, there are people who have already crept in unawares, and we must be aware of it and not unaware of it. We must be aware of it. We must have our faith firm in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. We must have our faith firm and what we know to be true about God and about God's Word and what we believe in the Word of God. There are those who doubt God. There are those who will deceive others and will, and will also uh, they will deceive them and beguile them by false doctrine. False doctrine. Doctrine is simply what we believe and teach. There's true doctrine, there's false doctrine. There's that which undermines and disagrees with what the Lord has said. There are many who are crept in. And I'm not, the purpose of the message today is not to talk about those who creep in, but to talk about how we are to contend for the faith uh, and why we should do this. We should contend for the faith because there are many who are crept in unawares without taking the whole time of the message to talk about who those people are and what they say and so on. That's not the purpose. The purpose is that we must contend for the faith that was once delivered. And it must be contended for in every generation. By the way, if you are a young person today, then the faith not only needs to be uh, contended for in this generation, those who are adults, but in your generation. As you grow up as a young person, it is upon you and it's your responsibility to contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. We must earnestly contend for it. And how are we to do this? Please notice with me, uh, these simple and basic things today. I want you to look down with me, if you will, in verse number 17. In this little book of Jude, verse number 17. 
How is it that we are to earnestly contend? I believe that this gives the answer. Because Jude talks about earnestly contending for the faith. He exhorts to earnestly contend for the faith. And then he, he gives a protracted uh, 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 a portion of this book. Most of the book, the vast majority of the book, is about the false teachers. It's about those who deny the Lord. It's about those who creep in unawares. And then he even mentions the Lord's coming and putting those to silence, and His judgment upon them, and the things that these false teachers do, and how they, as it says in verse number 16, that they have men's persons in admiration. In other words, by their good words and their fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple, because they can speak about things in a way that's convincing to people, and they have this advantage. And the Bible says that these are the type of people that God will judge. But, we come to verse 17. I like when we find the word but as this conjunction because now it's saying, all right, here's everything I just said. Here's everything I warned you about, but that's not the end of it. But let me speak to you now, he says. Let me speak to the beloved. Aren't you glad that you're in the beloved? Amen. That you're the beloved of God? The, the beloved in Christ. We are accepted in the beloved. It's a wonderful thought. The wonderful truth. But he speaks now to the beloved. Verse 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are the words? How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Now, from the authority of Scripture, and what the Scripture teaches, I believe, of course, we live in the last time. But he says, know that these words have already been spoken. That these things will happen. That there will be mockers in the last time. So in order that we will be able to earnestly contend for the faith, we must be remembering what we have been taught. We must be remembering it and not forgetting it. We must keep it alive. We must keep it strengthened so that we may remember what the Lord uh, has done for us and remember the faith. And dear friends, I remember, and, and the only reason I know the date is because someone else wrote it down for me. But I, I just remember the day and the time when I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I remember that. And I remember the day when I gave my heart uh, not only to Christ at that time, but then later gave my life to Him and said, I will do whatever you have for my life. I'm surrendered to you. I will live my life however you desire. If you will just lead and guide me in all that I do, I remember the faith that was delivered to me. And this must be something that's being contended for. And how will you contend for something that you're not convinced of? How will you contend for something that you don't remember or that you've forgotten about? We must remember, have you brought your mind back to the simplicity and the truth of the gospel? There's a remembrance that we must have of these things. He said, remember the words that were spoken by the apostles, that there would be mockers in the last time, those that would walk after their own ungodly lusts. The truth of the matter is, when people mock the Scriptures, when people mock what the Lord has said, it's actually for their own gain. It's actually for their own gain, for their own lust. And now we come to verse 19. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. They have separated themselves. Not the kind of separation that we may speak of. Or the separation we uh, would believe we ought to have as believers, a separation to the Lord. We've separated our lives to Him. We've given ourselves to Him. And then that separates us from the world, the flesh, and the devil. But these are they who have chosen to separate themselves unto the devil instead of to the Spirit of God. The Bible says, These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. Okay? Now verse 20. But ye beloved. Okay? Now we're back to the beloved. But ye beloved. Here is what we must do. I want to give you these simple things today. What we must do to earnestly contend for the faith. Would you write them down, please? Number one, 
we find in in verse number 20, we must be building up ourselves. We must be building up ourselves. Notice verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. And we dealt with this, but as believers, as Christians, dear friends, you have to be building. Because if you're not building, you're decaying. If you're not building, then you're actually falling apart. You're actually self-destructing. But we must be building, he says, on your most holy faith. And I'm not here even to deal with that specific phrase because that's quite a phrase. Your most holy faith. But that which you believe about Christ, it needs to be builded, not weakened, but it needs to be strengthened. And dear friends, how is it that you can strengthen it? Being faithful to church, right? Being faithful to the Word of God every day. Uh, uh, other things that we can do to keep those things in, 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 within our hearts and within our lives. And, and you have to choose how you're going to do that. But these basic things, you must be building up yourself on your most holy faith because this is how we will contend for the faith and for the truth that has been delivered unto us. Look quickly with me if you'll turn just back a few pages uh, to, to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 3. And we'll read at the very end of this book, 2 Peter uh, chapter number 3. Please notice with me, we, we actually have, I believe, in some ways, a parallel passage. Because Peter speaks of many things that Jude speaks about. And in similar ways, says similar things. But notice with me, please. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse uh, 17. Now again, we're dealing with false teachers in this in this uh, this book previously, but Second Peter chapter three verse seventeen. Ye therefore, beloved, there it is again, beloved. Let's all say that word together, beloved. Oh, are you glad you're in the beloved? Yeah. Amen. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. And you could be a Christian. It's possible that you could fall from the steadfastness that you have in your faith if you're not aware of what's actually going on, not aware of the tax on the the faith. But here's what we need to do. I love how the Lord doesn't just say, don't do this and don't do that. But He says, do this. Verse 18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. He says, but grow in grace. This is what we must do as believers. Growing in Him. If you're not growing, then you're stagnating. You're not getting anywhere. You're just staying in one spot. But He says, this is not what God intended for the Christian. He intended that we would grow in grace and in our knowledge of Him. Not in our knowledge of other things. Not in our knowledge of those who disagree with Christ. Those who are not of the faith. But in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear friends, you must be building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Turn with me to one more passage concerning this. If you'll turn back quickly here. Uh, just a few books to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And uh, I would write these references down. Get these things down. We must be building up ourselves. Colossians chapter number 2. Again, we speak of here in this passage, those who would beguile us with enticing words. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 4. Those who would beguile us with enticing words. Words And then look at verse number 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, have you received Christ Jesus the Lord? If you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Rooted and built up in Him. We must be rooted in our faith. You say, I don't know how to do that. Read the Word of God. Be faithful to coming to church. And by the way, um, we do these kind of things on Wednesday evenings. We build you in your faith. We talk about these things, these, these elementary sometimes and basic 
and valuable principles. You can be helped. I have been helped. You can be helped. Rooted and built up in Him and established. That means we would say established. A similar meaning here. Established firmly in our faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. The point is that we must be building up ourselves. Don't just be the same Christian you've been for 40 years. Don't just be the same Christian you've been for 20 years. Don't just be the same Christian you've been for two years or two months. But be building and growing up yourselves. And then we must hasten along. Number two uh, in our passage, not only if we will earnestly contend for the faith, not only must we be building up ourselves, but number two, please notice this, we must be praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. You say, what, what does that mean? Notice with me, if you'll return to our passage in Jude, he says in verse number 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You may ask, what does that mean? You know, it, it's not an easy thing to, to explain the difference between just prayer and praying in the Holy Ghost. But I believe that there is a reason it's worded this way. The Bible also says pray without ceasing. The Bible also says continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. He also says praying always with all prayer and supplication for all saints. He says that, but here he says praying in the Holy Ghost. I believe if we were to earnestly contend for the faith, this is not a mediocre prayer. This is not, oh Lord, help us. And that's it. But it's getting on our face before the Lord and, and beseeching Him and seeking after Him and realizing the Lord is the only answer that we have. The Lord is the only answer that you have in your life. Whatever it is you're dealing with, you say, Pastor, you don't know. You don't understand. I don't, but the Lord does. And the Lord's stronger. The Lord's greater. The Lord is your helper. The Lord is your refuge. The Lord can be there for you. And the Lord is the answer if you'll just pray. If you'll just pray. But not a, I'm not talking about a mediocre prayer, but a prayer that is filled with the Holy Spirit. A prayer that says, I'm going to put all else aside. I'm going to seek the Lord. This is what we need. This is what we must do to contend for the faith. Please understand that there is nothing more important. I said nothing more important. We could perhaps make an argument of things being of equal importance, but there is nothing of more importance than prayer. And it is never too late to pray. You say, you don't understand. You don't understand. Uh, it's too far. I've gone too far. Or maybe I think the country's gone too far. Well, as I've said many times before, if the Lord hasn't come back yet, it's not too late. It's kind of like you remember being a child and, uh, and you were misbehaving all day, and then you remember when your father knocked on the door and all of a sudden... You changed. All of a sudden, everything's different. It wasn't too late to get your act together. But when the Lord Jesus returns, there's no knocking on the door and saying you have five minutes. When the Lord comes, there's no more opportunity to get it right. I'm just saying to you today that it's never too late. If the Lord hasn't returned, it's never too late to get it right. It's never too late to start praying. It's never too late to have a victory in your life. It's never too late. And so, he says, praying in the Holy Ghost. Let it be a Spirit-filled prayer. A prayer that we strive in each day. Do not stop praying, but more so than ever. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Number three, please notice with me, uh, not only must we be building up ourselves, must we be praying in the Holy Ghost, but number three, we must be keeping ourselves in the love of God. Keeping ourselves in the love of God, as he says here in verse number 21. This does not mean that we can fall from the love of God. Please understand the meaning here. It does not mean that we have to keep ourselves earning His love. It does not mean that if we don't continue to do the right thing, then He will discontinue His love. 
It does not mean that He will ever stop loving us. The Lord will always love us. And by the way, He loves the sinner. And He died for the sinner. And He loves us. He died for us. We can never lose His love, but keeping ourselves in the love of God is a conscious, willing, volitional choice that we must make. That we will keep ourselves in the love that He has shown us. In the love that He has shown us. John chapter 14, verse 15. Write the reference down if you will, please. If you love me, keep my commandments. One of the first verses I ever learned, and it's been years ago, and I can remember it, learning this verse. Simple verse. If ye love me, keep my commandments. John 15, 14. Can you get any simpler than that? Some people say, I don't understand the Bible. Well, have you been to second grade? You know, I'm kidding. But, that's the simple truth. If you love me, keep my commandments. And this is how we continue, how we keep ourselves in His love. Uh, we dealt with last week, I believe it was, 1 John 5, verse 3. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. This is the love of God, 1 John 5, 3, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. They're not things that are burdensome. We say, I don't want to do what God wants because that's no fun. Well, any fun you have not doing what God wants only lasts for a short time. But His commandments are not grievous. They're not grievous. This is keeping ourselves in the love of God. We keep ourselves in the love of God does not mean we're trying to earn it. It doesn't mean I'm going to try to read my Bible and pray today because I want to make sure God loves me. That's not the way it works at all. We do those things because we know He already loves us. We love Him. You know the verse? Because He first loved us. One of my favorite verses. We love Him because He first loved us. Remember this, that we do not do what we do in order to. We do what we do because of. Not in order to, but because of. I do not serve God because I hope to gain or, or retain His love. Instead, I live for Him and serve Him because He continues to love me. Because He gave Himself for me. He gave His life for me. And so, this is not something we earn. This is something we have. The Lord has given us His love. Let me encourage you with this. Keep yourself in His love by nourishing yourself, encouraging yourself, like David did, in the most faint, discouraging time, the weakest time of his life. He had nobody to encourage him but he encouraged himself in the Lord as God. Nourish yourself. um, Encourage yourself in the Lord. Strengthen yourself in His love. Have you ever just sat and thought about His love for a moment? It's like the song says, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and goes lower than the deepest hell. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever more endure the saints and angels' song. And could we with ink the oceans fill, or were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, or every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole if stretched from sky to sky. The love of God is greater far. It's measureless. It's strong. It shall forever more endure. Have you ever thought about the love of God? and pondered it, and considered it in your life? Keep yourself in the love of God. And then number four, we find in verse number 21, we must be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Looking, that's the key word, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus unto eternal life. That means we're looking for Him. We're looking for the blessed hope. We're looking for the blessed hope. We're looking for His return. And I, I don't mean as, as the disciples did on that day of His ascension. We're looking with our sky, our heads literally to the skies. That doesn't mean that we're just waiting around. There's a difference between waiting and looking. That means we're looking, we're preparing. We know the good men of the house is on His way. He's coming back from a long journey. 
And when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Shall he find faith on the earth, looking for his return. This is how you honestly contend for the faith. Because you realize, hey, I don't know how much time I have. It's like uh, in Revelation, at the very end, what does the Bible say? That when Satan is cast into the earth, he has great wrath. Because he knows that his, he has but a short time. You and I should have great compassion and great passion in our hearts because we know that we have but a short time. We know we have but a short time. We don't know how much time it is, but we're looking for His return. We're looking on eternal things. And as Paul said to Timothy, lay hold on eternal life. We are so focused on this earthly uh, earthly things. We're so focused on everything around us that our eyes are here and not there. And instead of setting our affections on things above, we're setting our affections on this earth. But we must be looking towards eternal things. Write down the reference, if you will, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Where he says, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not on the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. We're looking for Him. Looking for eternal life. And then I want to give you a final thing. If you'll write this down, please. Not only do we see here, if we're going to contend for the faith earnestly, we must be building up ourselves. We must be praying in the Holy Ghost. We must be keeping ourselves in the love of God. We must be looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus unto eternal life. And then lastly, we must be making a difference. Making a difference. Notice verse number 22. The Bible says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. Have you ever thought that you want to make a difference? I have constantly. I want to make a difference. Have you ever thought that way? I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. I want my life, like the song says, I want my life to count for Jesus. How will you do this? You will do it by compassion. You will do it by the love of Christ. You'll make a difference. There's nothing greater than the love of the Lord in a person's life. We can make a difference by compassion. The end result, I believe, of contending for the faith. So all these things of building, keeping, praying, looking, it is so that we may make a difference. Make a difference. Why did God place us here? Why are we still here? Is it not because there is someone's life that needs to have a difference made in that life? Is it not because there's someone God wants us to have compassion on? Is there not someone that has a life that needs to be changed, not by our power, but by the power of Christ? Does He not desire that we would make a difference in someone's life? We are, we are dealing with this prison ministry and trying to get in with that, and you will never do anything like that unless you have some measure of compassion for people and the situations that they're in. But it may not be that. But it may be another situation that we have compassion on someone. That's how we'll make a difference. Through the love of Christ, contending for the faith, speaking the truth in love, and making a difference. And I don't know about you, but I desire to make a difference on as many people as I can uh, until the Lord uh, takes me home. If some have compassion, he says, making a difference. The end result of contending for the faith is that our life would make a difference in the lives of others. But this will only happen. This will only happen. Did you hear that? This will only happen if we will first remember the words that were spoken, that we will build up ourselves on the most holy faith, that we will be praying in the Holy Ghost. All these things are necessary that we will be keeping ourselves in the love of God, that we'll be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ in an eternal life, then, then, you can make a difference. You can make a difference. The Bible tells us here, in no uncertain terms, 
to earnestly contend for the faith. Not, not to be hoping that someone else will do it, but having a desire, having a zeal in our own hearts to earnestly contend for the faith. Let's bow in prayer together, may we?